Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Methods Guru for Sage Method Space. And I'm pleased to be joined here today with uh, three faculty members from the Bass Connections program at Duke University Charlotte Sussman, Manoj Manat Moen, Janet Bediger, and uh, before we get started with our conversation about interdisciplinary research, uh, I want to just uh, introduce you to Method Space. If you are new to this online community, uh, we are interested in all things to do with designing, planning, conducting, analyzing research, uh, writing about it, and sharing our results in all different kinds of ways. And you can see that at the center of this Venn diagram, we have teaching and learning, because we think that whether you are an experienced researcher or a student or just beginning, um, we all have something to learn. So I want to just uh, ask you to each uh, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about um, what your uh, field of uh, research and, and teaching is at Duke. So uh, Charlotte, why don't you start? Sure, um, my name is Charlotte Sussman. I'm a professor in the English department at Duke and my area of specialization is 18th century British literature. I work a lot on the um, history of slavery and colonialism in that period. Mm, okay, and Janet? Hi, thanks so much for having us here. I'm Janet Butker. I'm um, in the schools of medicine and school of nursing. So my teaching has actually predominantly been in this structure that we're going to talk about today related to Bass Connections. My own area of research um, and engagement with community and partners is around addressing disparities in healthcare, access mm -hmm. to healthcare and um, achieving the most uh, the best outcomes that people can achieve with the resources that are available. Mm -hmm. So bringing global issues locally and studying locally what we can inform globally. Great, okay. And Manoj? Hi, thanks for having me as well. Um, my, I'm at the School of Public Policy at Duke, the Sanford School of Public Policy, and most of my work focuses on topics related to applications from economic theory into in the space of health and healthcare. Um, so in broadly within that scheme, that space, I work on topics such as contract theory and, and how do you get providers to do better in terms of delivery of care, trying to measure quality of care, trying to understand how uh, interventions like monitoring and accountability interventions can actually improve care and so on and so forth. Um, again, uh, like Janet mentioned, I've been doing uh, some of this interdisciplinary teaching with Bass Connections for a couple of years, and it's, it has been really exciting and look forward to learning from everyone here. Well, we certainly have a multidisciplinary group, and let's face it, you know, th there, there are a few places where people from such different uh, areas, you know, would, would typically come together in a university. So, you know, right away, we can see that we have, you know, this real opportunity here. I wonder if each of you could just very briefly describe one of the projects that you have been involved with with Bass, and, you know, just tell us, you know, what the what the purpose of the study was, and, you know, what kind of uh, methods were used, to, you know, what kind of data collection or, you know, what kind of a process process was used. So. Um, Manish, why don't you start since you oh, were on the hot seat last? Think about the project we are currently working on because this is like right now mm -hmm. things we are working on. Um, we we are looking at issues around trust and violence in the context of healthcare. Um, this project started because we had, had been hearing lots about increasing instances of violence against doctors, nurses, but not just in one country, but in a host of countries around the world. So what we ended up doing was um, I had been talking with collaborators in Spain, in England, or across the street in U at UNC as well. And uh, we formed a team of investigators who were very interested. And then we reached out to our students to find essentially students who are not necessarily coming in from economics alone or mm -hmm. health services, but interested in gender and sexuality and women's studies and math mm -hmm. and computer science as well. Um, and so what we're doing with that project is three things. One is to try and understand if we can collect scrape data from online sources to um, mm -hmm. 
study if actually reporting of the violence against healthcare providers and doctors, nurses has been going on increasing in the world. The second one is a very detailed literature review from multiple disciplines, including sociology, psychology, anthropology, to understand what other disciplines can tell us mm -hmm, economists mm -hmm. about how to, how to think of violence and what are the factors that drive violence in these settings. And then finally, we are also working with our students to run an experiment. We are right now starting process of developing the survey design, and we want to try and do survey experiments to try and understand if we can change the, the social and cultural characteristics of individuals, does that make violence against those people more acceptable to others in the community or not? Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges here is there's always been this problem of othering. And so because of class and socioeconomic differences between healthcare providers and patients mm -hmm. in many of these settings, um, does that explain any of it at all? And can we see that in the survey data is one of the questions we're trying to answer. So that's a broad overview. Right. So I'll pause there. So, so you're using social media data from we online? Are, we did everything. Social media sadly did not work as well because mm -hmm. it works great in countries like the US and UK, mm -hmm. but we wanted to collect data all over the world. And mm -hmm. um, different countries use different types of data. Some countries use WhatsApp, which cannot be searched. Others right. use Weibo. And um, so, so that's been that's been a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but then we turned to newspaper reports. We did LexisNexis. We tried doing web scrapers. Um, yeah. So it's been it's been a fun learning experience for all of us. OK, great. So Charlotte, how, how about you? What have you been up to? So um, this project is ongoing, though it's moved out from under the aegis of Bass Connections. We just kind of aged out of that grant. But I've been working on a project on um, representing mortality in the middle passage of tra the transatlantic slave trade. There's been a lot of historical work trying to um, figure out, to calculate exactly how many people died between being captured in Africa and being sold in the new world, but very little work has been done on, um, so there's been a lot of work on how many, but very little work on where those people died in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And so this project has been trying to think of ways to geolocate those deaths. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then also um, thinking about how best to represent those sites of death since they take place and you know, what we think of as the featureless right. Atlantic. So, so what, um... What kinds of students get involved with this project? So it, this project actually started out. Um, it started out in one of the other collaborative workspaces that Duke has in, in a humanities lab that was called Representing Migration, and this was one of the kinds of um, forced migra migration that it looked at. Mm -hmm. And then it start. Then it moved into. Duke's um, program called Data Plus, which is looking at, which teaches students mostly from computer science and um, statistics fields like that to um, work with large data sets. And they mm -hmm. tried to, to work with large data sets that mm -hmm. have these numbers to try and figure out um, location. But in its Bass Connections form, it was actually a project of humanities graduate students mostly. Um, and so we worked with a combination of um, archival resource resources, trying to mm -hmm. find logbooks, and then to translate the data from those logbooks into um, mapping programs to geolocate mm -hmm. that and to find routes. Um, because we were humanities graduate students and trained in the humanities, we did a lot of work in that project around the uh, question of the ethics of representation, how best to mm -hmm how best to represent these very violent events in a way that was not spectacularizing them, that right. tried to bring back some kind of humanity to the lives that have been lost and take mm -hmm. them out, you know, to work between the realm of numbers and statistics and a, a kind of um, rethinking or recovering of the humanity of the people who had, who had lost their lives in that way. Mm -hmm. So it was very much a humanities, what you would call a digital humanities project. Mm -hmm. so those projects are mostly work with large data sets. And this project actually, I can tell you more, but it, it actually ended up working with a, quite a small data set um, and working in like 
what I like to call small data, trying to think about what um, these very specific events mm -hmm. might have to teach us about this larger event. So, so it, would you say, you know, partly kind of a big qual? A what? So qualitative side of it? Yeah, yes, um, it, in qualitative in the sense that it looked closely at questions of, of ethics, questions of history, um, questions of um, yeah, individual, the nature of an individual life and how you would, um, and people often talk about the, the violence of numbers in the slave trade, that the people, you know, people were taken from Africa, they were reduced to just numbers on a ledger or just a date in a logbook in terms of their lives. And we know nothing else about almost all of those people. Right. We don't know their names. We don't know where they came from. We don't know what language mm -hmm. they spoke, et cetera. So this, in terms of a, you know, kind of a qualitative effect, this project was very much trying to think about how to use digital or archival methods to push back against that violence that had stripped away all those other things, even, you know, even the place mm -hmm. that they died, how they had died. So yes, yes, it was the qualitative project, yes. So how about you, Janet, what, what have you worked with on Bass? Yeah, I, I've been involved for several years and, you know, I started this work actually through a, a theme that we have dedicated to global health. And it was actually while I was away, uh, we were abroad. I was abroad with a group of students when we uh, were introduced to a model um, in another country. And as the students started to talk about what we were observing, we realized that there was work that was happening in other countries that could really inform some of the, some of the challenges that we had locally. And the one specifically that, that, we, were, um, that we were really attuned to was all of our work had been very focused on individual access to healthcare, yet we were trying to promote the idea of having the best services and um, um, kind of continuity of those, those services to support people to live in the community. Mm -hmm. Yet what we were hearing from our stakeholders all over the world, we were working in 12 countries, what we, were, what we heard was when people got home, they literally had nothing. They had no one to go to. Mm -hmm. They didn't know who to ask. If they had, you know, just an immediate need, there was no connection for them. And we returned home. Um, so this is about two years into this work. And the team said, we have these problems right here in, in Durham, in North Carolina. Um, and as we started to look at it more closely, it, this was pre-pandemic when the, the data um, were becoming clearer and clearer in our very local community that there are many people living around us with what are sometimes we refer to as social needs, um, access mm -hmm. to food, access to housing. We have a big housing crisis, um, actually very mm -hmm. locally, um, some challenges there, not being able to access transportation. These, what are being called social needs aren't available and these things facilitate their ability to mm -hmm. have better health and better health outcomes. And so here's this problem that now has escalated uh, and people are, are much more aware of it, especially in the last two years. But again, from a healthcare perspective, our healthcare system in the U.S. isn't organized to address it. Mm -hmm. um, there was this call from the National Academies of, of, of Medicine, or and NASM actually, um, overall, and they had put forward these recommendations for the integration of health and social care, but models in the UK were positioned well, Canada has moved forward, other countries, but we just are not organized well to look at this. And so the students, the, the third problem that motivated a shift in our work were that the students want to be engaged, they want to learn, they wanna become leaders in this space, they wanna become healthcare professionals, many of them. And as learners, they don't have an opportunity to move this work forward. But what we found were, and this was very student driven, there were student led models to support building capacity for healthcare settings to address social needs. So here we have mm -hmm. students wanting to be involved. Healthcare doesn't have the capacity to do the work that they're being asked to do right. and significant needs in the community. And so we spent a year just studying these models, meeting a lot of people who were doing this work um, and just understanding how that worked. And we met with local leaders to say, can we do this here? And so for two years, we developed the model to implement it in a local federally qualified health center. It is now outside of Bass and is externally funded and being scaled to Duke Health 
and to other centers. It's in our emergency department now. But you know, it's really thinking about we have we have gaps locally um, that we can address. And you asked what methodology we needed to learn about improvement science. We needed to learn about implementation science. Mm-hmm. We needed to talk about community engagement, stakeholder engagement. But every you know layer of the onion we peeled, there was so much more to learn. Right. Um, and I think we're still learning, and that's what's exciting about this work. So with each of these just using these projects as an example or you know something else if you if you want to um i'm wondering how you know for each of you and you introduced yourselves originally initially in this interview we talked about your uh disciplinary foundations so you know how do you think about the interdisciplinarity that is kind of intrinsic to the bass connections program and have your experiences doing these projects through BASS influenced your own research and teaching kind of back in your home disciplines. Um, so um, we'll just go in the same in the same sequence uh, if you want to start, Manoj. Thanks, Janet. Um, yes, it, it definitely has. And it, there's always this influence that it brings back to my own research and teaching. So one of the first past Connection projects I did was with my colleague, Jim Moody, who is a sociologist here at Duke mm-hmm. and is our networks guru. Um, and we were doing, we started that project because I don't work on networks at all. Um, I had no training and no understanding of that work, but I had collected as part of another project where we were looking at accountability interventions and we were going to go to every single one of the 22,000 households in that area. Um, we said, well, if you're going to go there, might as well start collecting some interesting information on who talks to whom. And so we said, since we were going to do that anyway, then we brought uh, Jim on board and learned about mm-hmm. networks as part of that project. And then students came on, helped us analyze the data. There were a couple of students who had been working with Jim. And I myself, I wish I had learned more R programming that was used in that network analysis. While I did, I learned definitely less analysis um, myself. I learned the value of looking at that and the topics that were interesting in there and use that to develop new research projects building from that with Jim. And now we have a couple of NIH funded small projects that we are using that data and that partnership to build up from there. Mm-hmm. So my own research has definitely veered into the network space over time, which mm-hmm. came directly from there. And it has helped with teaching as well. Um, this current project is much more interdisciplinary. So I'm now learning a lot more about how anthropologists and sociologists think about violence versus how the economic theories were. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that going forward, this will feature in our research and teaching as well. So. It's, it's been a great learning experience. I will just say that it's not costless because when, when you're doing this, it's if you want to really make it worthwhile, you have to put in a lot of time. And mm-hmm. I was actually initially taken aback by how much time one needs to put to learn something new. I guess I'd forgotten that part. So, so in terms of lo- learning the other disciplinary perspectives or learning more about how to, how to run a project like this with student researchers? Oh, or both, bo- actually. Or both. Yeah, no, both. They're both different and they're, they both take learning. And I think I, I probably was ill-prepared because I hadn't thought that carefully about what it takes to take a small group of students and carefully mm-hmm. plan learning activities that help them learn, but mm-hmm. also further our own research goals as well. Mm-hmm. And those are not necessarily the same tasks. And so one has to find mm-hmm. the confluence of the two and it's a very deliberate mm-hmm. process um, I will, however, give full credit to our current project manager. She's actually a master's student who comes from the bioethics program and has been phenomenal. Like if the one week when she couldn't join us because of personal reasons, the whole project seemed to be falling apart because she's <laughs> the one who's able to see what the investigators want to study, what the students want to learn, and the tasks that we can accomplish mm-hmm. in that one and a half hours of meeting and the 10 hours of work afterward. And, so it takes a lot of work, but I think it can be done well. It can be very productive. Right. Um, and bring so many other dimensions to the study of the questions that you started out with than, than if you'd just gone at it, you know, oh, even, yeah. if you, even if you'd been doing a 
faculty student research, but only within your own field, wouldn't have gotten quite that, you know, all of those dimensions uh, involved. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one last sentence. So one of our colleagues, um, he was the former chair of the economics department at UCL and is a very famous game theorist. The reason he came on board with this project is because he wanted, he saw the opportunity to learn from our students from multiple other disciplinary perspectives um, as he was helping us think about, think about writing mm -hmm. a new model, a game theoretical model of violence. He clearly understood that just thinking within the boundaries of economics was not useful. We needed to mm -hmm. learn from elsewhere. So this was a very deliberate effort to bring in learnings from mm -hmm. other disciplines as well. Great, okay. So how about you, Charlotte? Yeah, I would agree. It really has changed my my research and my teaching. The I think in terms of my own research, it just has, you know, somehow given me the confidence to follow my curiosity about these mm -hmm. things. So I am still working on this question of oceanic death. And I this um, past fall reached out to try and find an oceanographer who could yeah. help me, this is kind of my own personal mm -hmm. um, question, help me think about um, what would have happened to the bodies of enslaved people after, um, after they were overboarded, so to speak, after they were put into the ocean, could, would it be possible to model descent in that way and found an oceanographer who was willing to take on this question and we're still working on it. We still need to reach mm -hmm. out to people in forensic science. Um, so to try to combine, those are three disciplines. I don't think you usually see combined oceanography, English literature and forensics. Right. Um, so that's an ongoing project. And I don't think I would have even occurred to me that it was possible that I could just like approach an oceanographer and we could have a conversation about this. And it's not like I've learned much about physical. I mean, I've learned a whole bunch about physical oceanography. I certainly cannot do it, but I can understand mm -hmm. what people are talking to me about it. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's just been just fascinating to just learn about other things. And, and of course that seeps back into my more specifically English literature teaching. But um, I would echo what Manoj just was talking about in terms of the time. I was also unprepared for how much time it takes to actually mm -hmm. um, move a group project along, like how much work you have to do on the front end mm -hmm. to get people to do something and then on the back end to follow through and keep that project mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. forward. That was a real um, learning curve for me. But now that I have that in my you know, skill set, it really has helped moving classes mm -hmm. forward. Um, I, I heard in some you know, workshop that really as a good leader, the thing you should be able to do is not be present and have your team still move forward along mm -hmm. the same lines. And I've taken that to heart. And so I really see my job as teaching them, teaching the team also the right. skills of how to move a, a project forward and how to organize things. And that has right. been um, very rewarding to be able to, to pass those skills along and to mentor people in doing that. Um, and I'll say one more thing about this kind of teaching, which is that I think about a lot, which is when you have a an outcome, which is not usually you teach English literature, people read books, they write papers, they write a research paper, whatever. But when you have a different kind of project that you're trying to put together, it really focuses you on the methods you will need to learn to do that. Mm -hmm. And so then when you read other resources, other projects you read, you try to do historical research, it also focuses your attention on methodology in a way that's unusual in my field. You're not trying to absorb information. You're trying to master methods or understand the advantage mm -hmm, of one yeah. method over another, which I think is extremely valuable for beginning researchers to learn right. to understand that like information or research or projects don't just come into existence, somebody right. has to actively decide how to do it. Right. And then when they themselves become researchers, they are able to, to think about that more objectively, clearly, pragmatically. So that, that's that been really interesting. Right, so I, I mean, it, it seems like, you know, there are, you know, all of these kind of more process skills that people learn in addition to the content, whereas they were just learning this, you know, in, in either of your 
you know, kind of coursework, you know, you wouldn't gain those kinds of skills, which, you know, all of us know are the kinds of things that can make or break, you know, any, you know, whatever it is they may be going to do next, whether it's research or, you know, some area of professional life, being able to, you know, understand how to get people to work together to do something and, and to, you know, the, the different steps involved. But the other thing that really struck me in hearing, you know, both of you just in, in hearing you talk, the kind of enthusiasm and energy, and even though you know, there's a lot of work involved, I can't help but think that, you know, for the students to see your, you know, kind of uh, curiosity, uh, you know, co coming out and kind of, well, you know, this leads to that, you know, that, it, you know, research is not just like, well, we design it, we conduct it, and then it's done, <laughs> you know, that there are like pathways that keep, you know, you know, and then other projects spin off but to go look into that, but, you know, that there's that, that energy that about, you know, just hearing uh, you talk that I, I can't help but think, you know, the students m must find that, you know, really engaging. And let's face it, you know, students are, you know, they're looking to the faculty to, you know, I mean, there's that, you know, it, there's a role model aspect to it. I mean, you know, when you're trying to figure out like, well, you know, what am I going to be like as an adult when I grow up and when I'm in a professional job and, and how will I treat other people? I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, so there, to me, you know, there are all kinds of little sort of sub uh, um, areas, you know, to, you know, what you've discussed that, that would not come, come across in just a straightforward description of a project. So, Janet, why don't you uh, go ahead and, and talk about, you know, how's the interdisciplinary aspect played back into your own work? Yeah, Janet, thanks because you know that your synthesis just there spoke directly to, to where I feel this model um, worked really well for our group anyways. And it really was, um, energy was something I think we all felt. Um, mm -hmm. And when it, when it dropped, we all felt it and we, we thought about that. So we used a, a model of appreciative inquiry. We were always mm -hmm. looking for who to engage, how to engage them. And it was really this aspect of interdisciplinarity that reminded us to think broadly. Um, we, we designed our team so that everybody was recognized for whatever they brought. Um, there was kind of a leveling and I, I was very uh, transparent as were our, our other co-leaders. This is what I know and I do in my day to day, but there's a lot that I don't know and don't do that we need to find other people for. And it was sometimes even as specific as, you know, the students wanted to do a survey on whatever it was. Yes, I do surveys, several of us do surveys, but we have survey experts at Duke. So mm -hmm. let's go find them, let's go meet them. Let's learn the best ways to do that. Let's learn what those tips are from the people that do this all the time. It broadened their network, it broadened mine. I met new people. There was a great example when we had these data, we were trying to think about creating a website and you know using it as a, as a way to, to meet with other other schools and other models. And the students were great. I knew nothing about developing a website, so they took that on. Um, but the data visualization, how to communicate information right. is in and of itself a skill. Yeah, Sure, a lot of us do it. We do it because we have to, uh, but we have experts in that and people who do this, they've studied it, they learn it. And I was like, let's bring them in. Let's learn from them. Let's have it, let's you know, open mm. this up to our partners so we can all use this as a skill building opportunity. And it was that constant, um, identification of where are we headed, who else can help us get there. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe it, sometimes it took us a little off track, but sometimes it was worth it just to meet somebody new and think about their work. Um, but some of those very specific skills that, yeah, we could have done and we would have done okay with them. I think we were just informed differently by broadening our network, thinking big, mm -hmm. who else is here? A lot of times it wasn't necessarily at our institution. Um, students on spring break would set up some great meetings with partners I'll never meet in person, but they did. And I was like, this is great. You know, how many people we've mm -hmm. learned from that have now mm -hmm. been networked globally. So I just, I really appreciated the reminder for us to be interdisciplinary in our work because that helped all of us, I think, to think differently. And, and for me, it's something that I, I now try to incorporate, um, 
asking everybody, like, who else should we be thinking to bring into this discussion? Right, right. And in, I mean, in your description at the at the very beginning, talking about your project, where you know there, you know, activities that are kind of outside the the scope. You know, when when people come for medical procedure and then you know they go out the door, not our problem anymore. We've got other people that are in the hospital and you're you know, we're, we're taking care of them there or, or in the clinic or whatever the, you know, uh, you know, that's not our, not our problem. So, so, you know, to have the students see, well, even if it isn't, you know, part of your job description to do these, that there are, you know, ways of, you know, finding other approaches to, to solving the, these kind of broader, uh, broader, issues that you know ultimately probably are connected because you know do the people end up you know back in the hospital because they didn't take care of themselves or they didn't have a way of taking care of themselves at home so you know it seemed to me that you know it, it um, would help students to just think about kind of you know whatever the parameters are of the work that you do you know there there are still you know other ways of, of looking at the bigger issues and, and engaging with with others, either other entities or individuals to, you know, to address those broader problems. And, you know, I mean, I personally think that, you know, a lot of the, you know, social problems that we have today, you know, you, you can't solve it by just one, you know, like, oh, well, we're going to just take care of this part of it. And you're like, yeah, well, what about the other parts of it? That are you know you know part of the causes. So it seemed to me that it would really just have them encourage them to ask different questions than they might otherwise do. Hundred percent. We now have more questions than we have answers. But that's okay. We'll continue right. you know chipping away at them. Right, and we can we can all hope you know for the future that these students will go out into the world with a with a different attitude, you know, whether they go on in academia or, or go straight into an, a professional uh, position that, you know, they're going to tackle it, you know, from a, from a very different perspective than someone who is, you know, spent um, their entire um, bachelor's or, or master's or even doctoral, you know, programs kind of within a more prescribed uh, curricular experience. Um, I want to just um, ask you, each, if you would um, think about suggestions you might offer to faculty who might be watching this and thinking, hmm, you know, I'd like to do something like this with my own, uh, with my the course that I teach, maybe adding some more of a practicum uh, to the class where there's some project-based learning, or maybe I want to uh, think about networking with other faculty at my university. Um, I realized that with the BAS connections, you're working within uh, an established program where there's a kind of a infrastructure in place. Um, but you know, what what would you suggest to someone who, you know, is uh, intrigued by these ideas and would like to, you know, at least take some small steps in this direction? So we'll just go in our in our same uh, sequence. So when I was, if you would start. Two things come to mind. One is you mentioned that, you know, yes, we are fortunate that at Duke, we do have the Bass Connections project that has an established process for mm -hmm. bringing in students, but it's not, it's possible to, to create independent study programs or practicums for your courses that can replicate that similar experience. Mm -hmm. the, the, the main thing I would think about in that setting would be oftentimes if you if we'd had this conversation about six years ago before I had first done a Bass Connections project I would have always assumed that unless a student is already trained in some disciplinary aspect of the subject I want to teach or the subject I want to conduct a research project on I would assume that the student would not want to do those readings or would not be able to follow mm. on. I now know that a student who is a gender and uh, a gender and human studies or human sexuality studies um, major is also fully capable of reading a complex paper from economics and have just as good mm -hmm. insights, if not sometimes better, um, as someone who is coming in from a disciplinary training because they don't come in with blinders on. 
They are mm -hmm. unafraid to ask questions about things we all just take for granted. And that has been a great learning experience. So the so you know, just recognizing that students are in the program because they want to be inquisitive learners, not necessarily discipline mm -hmm. first, is a is a great starting point. And that sort of helps open up the boundaries mm -hmm. of the disciplinary uh, in, interdisciplinary inquiry that you're you're pursuing. So uh, what about since you mentioned at the beginning that you know one of I think you said your one of your initial projects with uh, someone who is a sociologist. Yeah. Um, you know, how did you, you know, do you have suggestions for people who want to reach out to faculty in other parts of a university where, you know, the, how, um, did you, how did you begin that process? In that, that one was, I, I cannot take credit, that was something that happened completely by chance. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a population research institute where Jim and I had frequently met at seminars and stuff, and mm -hmm. I knew what he worked on, and I reached out. He was very generous with his time, mm -hmm. so he sat down and heard me out for half an hour. It's entirely possible that some people might and some people might not, but that's that's the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. um, just to give you another example, not related to Bass, next week I'm meeting with a colleague from computer science because I've come to know now that there is a big effort that uses machine learning and AI processes to um, study causal inference here at Duke that can actually use the data that I'm collecting and possibly use it in ways I never thought was possible. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what that's going to be. I It took us a couple of months to find time and I'm going to sit down with, them, with my faculty colleague and maybe something will come out of it, maybe it won't. But um, in, in some sense, this is all a, a result of learning what the benefits of interdisciplinary research can be. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had this meeting six years ago, maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Charlotte? Um, yeah, thanks. I think the the advice I have is not so much about how to get started, but how not to get discouraged. <laughs> Those are the uh -huh, things I'd uh -huh. like to speak to. Um, one thing is that it can take a little longer for group projects to move forward than for individual projects. At least in my field, mm -hmm. we mostly work individually and we move as fast as we can and if we're not moving fast it's only our own fault right so i think it took it takes a while to adjust to the speed of working with a group mm -hmm. um and you just have to just have faith that you know it might not be going as fast as you think it could but you're learning things along the way so not to get discouraged by that and also not to get discouraged by the fact that not all aspects of something might work out like I think, you know, academics, we think everything we do, we should be able to use later on, but it just is the case that sometimes with a project like this, you go down an alley that turns out to be a blind alley and you have to give up on it. Um, and that seems like waste, but I think it, it's usually not waste or not complete waste because you are learning something as you do it and now you, you know that that's not a good alley to have gone down, but it can, I think, um, it can be frustrating, you know, as you, mm -hmm. if you have in mind that every everything is going to count, everything right. is going to produce an outcome. Um, and yeah, the same thing for what you were just talking about, about contacting people outside your own discipline. It can take a while, you know, not everybody is going to be interested in this um, this kind of approach and you just have to accept that and then accept that the people who do um, respond who are interested are going to be mm -hmm. good uh, are interested and so it's worth it's worthwhile to just keep persisting I think in that yeah. kind of effort and not to give up because you know the first one or two people you try to contact don't get back to you or aren't interested, um, especially outside your own institution. I think inside an institution, there's a kind of professional courtesy, but outside the institution, it can just it can just take a while, but that's no reason to be discouraged with it. I think you just have to have some some patience with this kind of thing um, mm -hmm. and just and be willing to think that some, not everything is going to work out. That's just the way it is. Yeah, right, right. Trial and error. Yeah, try, yeah. Yeah, trial and error until you hit on the right approach. Oh, and then also, um, I guess maybe this goes without saying, just realize that you're gonna learn things, that what your your mm -hmm. end outcome might not be exactly your perfect vision of what mm -hmm. you thought it was that you're gonna learn from your group and maybe be um, 
have it shaped by things that they are interested in that you hadn't considered before, but that are very important to them and that you're going to learn from that. And um, that's kind of the best part of the experience is, is finding your own worldview or your own ideas changed by, um, by group mm -hmm. work, but it's, it's not something we always expect to have happen. So, yeah. Right. So it sounds like both openness and flexibility. Yes. And humility. I think also, um, yeah. And that's a tough one for some academics. Let's face it. It is, it is, but it's a good one. We should learn it, yeah, yeah. yeah. How about you, Janet? And, and, you know, maybe comment a little bit about the relationships working kind of more in the community since your project had that bridging as well. Sure, happy to. And I, actually, my first point builds it exactly off of Charlotte's last. Um, and part, part of that is everybody that, um, you know, comes forward to be a part of the team, learning early, what are their expectations and revisiting mm -hmm. that often. I think, you know, I've tried to be, it's part of the way I, I do um, my research and participate in research teams also, but bringing them into the classroom, I think students sign up, like this wasn't required, right? So for them to sign up for something, understanding why they're there, what it was that attracted them to be there. Do they think that they're going to have a certain end point? Because sometimes they don't at the end of a semester, where's their comfort level of things, you know, carrying over mm -hmm. into the summer over break into their next year after they graduate. Some of these things have gone on for a while. So really understanding their expectation, their commitment, where are those? And, and mm -hmm. not including our community partners. And one of the things I appreciated Charlotte that you had just said was, was really understanding, you know, there were some early, um, there were milestones, but they, they really were products, you know, that we could celebrate and being okay that if we got there, we should celebrate and acknowledge that. And if that was as far as we got, or if it informed mm -hmm. a different direction, let's talk about it and pivot. And that was actually a, a skill set. We brought in somebody from the business school to teach us about pivoting um, because it was it's difficult for, particularly for some of our, well, actually it was difficult for different members for different reasons to accept that we were now going to slightly shift from what we said we were going to do when we started in August, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. So that you mentioned flexibility, I think that was critical. So um, transparency and revisiting expectations, being flexible. I think the other thing, having now done this as part of a class, like an actual structured syllabus and curriculum over two semesters, and I now also do this in my research, is thinking um, really thoughtfully and with everybody talking about what engagement means. Um, and so when we, when we reach out to someone, really having an open discussion about what that's going to mean, what are we asking for? What are we bringing them into? Mm -hmm. um, this may come back to expectations, but you know, a lot of this was, we tapped a lot of people for information. And we, I think we needed to be responsible um, and responsive to them, why they volunteered their time to teach us, to share mm -hmm. with us, to, mm -hmm. to whatever that was, and, and letting them know how it turned out, where things were, right. why we're not going forward anymore. And that was a lesson for all of us. I think for research in particular, we don't, we still could do better um, in responding back to the people we engage and sharing with mm -hmm. them how mm -hmm. we did. Um, so doing that, I think with our coursework and our curriculum as well, when we engage people outside of our immediate environment, we should let them know how things turn out. So before we close, is there anything else you would like to add, uh, either points about this work or recommendations uh, to people who are listening to this uh, interview? Manoj, anything, anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I don't covered? have anything specific to add. I think, I think both Charlotte and Janet have covered um, everything. And um, I just want to say it's actually very, exciting possibility if we can get it done if we have to yeah, need to need to find some patience mm -hmm. and um and sometimes some creativity to keep the students engaged because they can they can tell when the when the course or the program starts um slagging a little bit and that that slag is that slag phase is when everyone starts losing patience and you need mm -hmm. to then come up with creative ideas to get everyone right back up and find something mm -hmm. to work. but it can right. be very rewarding at the end of that yeah Charlotte, anything else you'd like to add? Um, not really. I mean, the one practice we did 
which maybe from a humanities perspective is we did a lot of collaborative writing, my mm. group, and which was very, um, involved a lot of trust that we would be able to speak to each other honestly about, we were writing mostly about the ethics of representation mm -hmm. and um, it took a little longer than writing on your own. Um, but that experience of um, kind of being that vulnerable with each other to test out drafts and to comment on each other's, what we said was really just one of the best experiences of my whole career to have written collaboratively mm -hmm. with graduate students about these very, very tough issues about right. race and representation and right. our own subject, you know, our own perspective right. and subject position. And so I would recommend it, but, uh, you know, again, with all these caveats of patience and humility and um, responsibility, transparency. Right. So, yeah. Right, right. Dealing with collaborative writing is, is difficult to begin with, but dealing with the sensitive issues that people might be, you know, coming from you know, variety of uh, perspectives and perhaps even, you know, knowing that their ancestors might have been, you know, on, on, on one side or the other of that issue and there's uh, a lot to yeah. think about. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really was. And so I'm just, you know, I think I've never been prouder of students for them for um, coming together mm -hmm. to do this and to work on it with me across that kind of power divide. And so, yeah, so it's very, very rewarding, worth trying, I think. Anything else you'd like to add, Janet? I think one additional point maybe I'd like to add um, related to actually my colleagues' comments here is that, you know, we are fortunate to have this infrastructure where we are. Um, but for people considering this work, it, it is possible in, uh, in a regular course, again, with setting expectations for what's doable within the mm -hmm. time and the resources that are available, um, but also within research. And I think for me, where, where most of my time is in research, I've really started to try to influence my colleagues to think about, and, and honestly, the systems we work in, to build in the opportunities to fund students from undergraduate mm -hmm. and through graduate on our funded awards, like that should be an opportunity to engage people that we mm -hmm. don't always um, build. And that's a systems issue. Every investigator applying for an external award, I think should be asked, will you have a learner, a trainee involved in this work mm -hmm. to be able to open the opportunity? Because a lot of students want these opportunities and they're not available to them. Right. They don't know how to ask. Um, and so we may not have a vast structure everywhere, but how do we begin to build these experiences for people to have the opportunity there to engage them in work that they might not have had otherwise. And I think mm -hmm. a systems intervention of having the opportunity built into external funded awards is something we could do to move that forward. Great, well, thank you all so much for uh, talking with me. And I, I really you know, wish you the best as you I'll continue with your your own research and your projects with the students because uh, it just seems like a a real opportunity for the proverbial win win. So um, wish you the best. Thanks so much. Thanks so Thank much for this much. opportunity. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you,